Hello, I'm Carter Murphy, uh, and welcome to the SMU uh, video archive series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. Today, we have with us Alan Coleman. Dr. Coleman was, uh, came as Carruth Professor of Financial Management in 1974 and became Dean of SMU School of Business between 74 and 81, and then Director of the Southwestern Graduate School of Banking from 1981 until his retirement in 1988. Welcome, Alan. Good morning, Carter. Why don't we begin by asking you to tell us something about your coming to SMU and what was here when you came? Well, I came to SMU in the summer of 1974 coming at that time from four or five years in business uh, where I had been working uh, and returned to the academic community and was offered and accepted the Carruth Chair in Financial Management and joined the SMU Business School as a faculty member in finance with the Carruth Chair, which was in fact the first chair established in the Business School by the Carruth family. Um, I came in the summer of 1970, began, uh, 1974, and began teaching uh, immediately at that time. And then um, within, oh, three or four weeks of my arriving and not related to my arrival in any way, the then president of the university, Paul Hardin, was dismissed uh, and then began a whole series of changes which over the next 14 years led to seven presidents and acting presidents in a 14-year period. But in any case, uh, soon after uh, Paul Hardin, the president, uh, left, uh, the um, new incoming president uh, was uh, James Umberg. And um, at that time, uh, there was a fair amount of turmoil in the business school related to the then Dean Jackson Grayson, who in uh, 1973 or 1971 had gone to Washington to serve as price commissioner under President Nixon. Yes, I know that story well because I was in Washington at the time. Uh huh. Well, when Jack, Grayson came. Jack returned to the business school in 1973. But he got so involved in Washington and ensnarled in all of that new world that when he returned, he really didn't return to the business school as dean. Uh, and there was an executive dean, Bobby Lyle, <coughs> who was in effect running the school. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in that summer of and into the early fall of 74, uh, matters became uh, increasingly tense in the business school and there were genuine concerns about Jack Grayson and his leadership of the business school. Jack must have come to SMU in 1962 or thereabouts and so had had about eight years in the deanship. A little uh, later I think but I'm not certain but it was a few years <coughs> in any because case. Because Jack came at the time, I think I became chair of the Department of Economics. And in a, in a breakfast meeting, Jack announced that he would prefer the Department of Economics be uh, out of the School of Business. Uh, That's right. And uh, that must have been in 1962. What kind of business school had he created? Well, when I came uh, in the summer of 74, in fact, as we reflect back on it, it was really a pretty weak place. We, Jack had instituted a number of curricular changes that caused our accreditation for the bachelor's degree to begin to be questioned. The master's degree was unaccredited at that time. And the faculty generally, I would say, was mixed but not particularly strong. Jack Grayson made a number of appointments that were somewhat controversial, non-traditional, uh, and caused concern among some faculty, and there was quite a division among the faculty about the leadership of the school. 
so I would say overall the business school was really rather weak. Its academic standards were not terribly high. Our um, exam and test scores for admissions to the master's program were uh, really uh, about 50th percentile. They were, they were just average. And the place was in enough disarray that uh, clearly something needed to happen. So that's kind of where we were in the fall of 1974. I remember well the divisions in the faculty which uh, Jack tended to uh, inspire. And uh, those divisions I think were probably somewhat healed under the kind hand of Bobby Lyle who served as acting dean while Jack was in Washington. That's correct. When Jack came back, did he come back then as dean? He came back as dean, but he was gone much of the time, and Bobby Lyle was really running the school from a practical point of view. And Jack continued very actively in Washington and in the national scene in terms of so many of the contacts he had established in Washington but was in effect not spending very much time with regard to the business school. That's right. It has to be said for Jack, I think that he was a successful administrator of the Wage and Price Stabilization Act. Uh, perhaps more successful than he had been as dean at SMU. The, uh, you spoke of the succession of presidents, Alan and in particular the departure of Paul Hardin, which took place only a few months after your arrival, perhaps less than that. A few that. weeks, yeah. A few weeks. Do you know anything about uh, the circumstances of his departure? Well, as I understand it and as I learned subsequently, um, there were brewing athletic scandals that Paul Hardin had learned about and was evidently prepared to go forward uh, ethically to the NCAA and um, I believe the problems then developed with regard to the domination of two or three very powerful members of the Board of Governors which was the ruling uh, governance structure of the university at that time and Hardin, uh, President Hardin apparently wanted to go forward and reveal and, and disclose these recruiting activities and he um, I believe ran afoul of three of the governors particularly uh, uh, Ed Cox, uh, Robert Stewart and uh, Bill Clements and the long and the short of it was that uh, acting on their own authority as I understand it at least he was fired and then um, Willis Tate was brought back to uh, as acting president and then ensued over the next... With, with the title of Chancellor, was he not? Yes, he was emeritus at that time, mm -hmm. and he came back as Chancellor for a year, or a little less, about an academic year, um, while a search was underway to replace Paul Hardin. And um, uh, then ensued over the next 14 years, as I said, seven presidents and acting presidents, and the university during all of those f years from 1974 to 1988 probably underwent the greatest strains of administrative leadership and s governance structure uh, perhaps in the history of this institution. And a great deal of it gravitated, as I learned in subsequent years, around the domination by the Board of Governors, which was a subcommittee of the Board of Trustees, but which had governing power, and the dominance of three people on that board, namely Ed Cox, Robert Stewart, and um, uh, Governor Clements. And those three exercised virtual dictatorial control of the board, at least as perceived by the deans on campus and many of the longtime thoughtful faculty members here. And those set of events and eventually the leadership uh, challenges that occurred and the ensuing athletic scandals which erupted in the late 70s and early 80s uh, ultimately led to a major restructuring of the university governance system 
the removal of several members of the Board of Governors, including those three that I mentioned, and a restructuring to bring the presidency of the university into the role it should have uh, enjoyed all along, which was one of controlling the academic affairs of the institution and the governing boards being in a policy and monitoring role, uh, which prior to that time the Board of Governors had been actively engaged in major management decisions regarding the university. I was president of the faculty senate in the year that the year following Ken Pai's arrival when this restructuring was taking place. And for the first time in history, the president of the faculty senate was sitting as a member, a non-voting member, but a member of the board of trustees. So I remember that uh, restructuring well. There was on one occasion when someone said something should be handled by the executive committee of the board, but Ray Hunt, who was then the chair of the board of trustees, said that enough had been done by the executive committee of the board in the board's name, and he would not uh, relegate this to, a, to an executive board decision. That so, was the transition as that occurred under Ray Hunt and subsequent individuals that brought the board back into an appropriate managerial oversight and balance with the president and provost of the university. And uh, that represented a dramatic change for the better uh, and began the healing process at SMU, which was so desperately needed. Yes. Then, Alan, let me see. That was in the summer of 74. Uh, and you spoke of uh, Jack Grayson's leaving the deanship in the autumn of that year. That's right. And I was asked, um, I had just arrived in June of 74, and in the fall of that year, 74, I was asked to serve as acting dean while a search went on uh, because uh, Jack had been removed uh, from the deanship, uh, and I agreed to serve in that capacity. And a uh, search began, and uh, about February or March of 75, I was approached by the search committee and asked if I would be willing to consider accepting the permanent deanship, and after some discussion, I agreed to do that. So that was early 75, and then I continued in that role as dean until 1981, uh, retaining the Carruth professorship, uh, although I did not teach in those years because the demands of the deanship just took all the time I could spare. You had a task on your hand. I did. And I, uh, as one who was in the university at that time, can testify the, the uh, great, uh, the great springtime of uh, development, I think, that began in the School of Business at the time you became dean. You mentioned uh, the Carruth chair. What was Will Carruth's relationship to the university at that time? Well, Will Carruth's family, his grandfather and his father, really uh, made the seminal, most critical um, commitment to the founding of SMU by way of a grant of land uh, which encompasses the current SMU campus and ran all the way from the current campus up to Northwest Highway in a block of land that was intended to provide income to the university. And Will Carruth, Jr., um, uh, was from his earliest years aware of and interested in SMU because of his grandfather and his father. But the Carruth family founded, really helped to found the university because that grant of acreage was the turning point in bringing SMU to Dallas. And there is in the lobby of the Perkins Administration Building a plaque which records the original SMU grant of lands from the Cruth family, a plaque which several of us, myself included, uh, caused to be made, and a ceremony was held to honor Will Carruth for his family's contributions to SMU, uh, and that plaque, we hope, will remain permanently in the lobby of the Perkins Building. 
Uh, Will Carruth also granted the uh, business school its first endowed chair, the one that I held during those 14 years I was here. And also he created the Carruth Institute of Owner-Managed Business, and he created a, an institute in the School of Engineering. Uh, he made gifts to the Meadows School of the Arts in the uh, Carruth Auditorium and uh, engaged in philanthropy over the years of a significant nature to SMU. So the Carruth family were very critical, and I was very honored to hold the Carruth chair since it was the first of now subsequently many endowed chairs in the business school. And you maintained a friendship with uh, Will Carruth and his family, did you not, Ellen, during that period of time? Yes, Will and I stayed uh, close. I would visit him two or three times a year, bring him up to date on what we were doing in the business school, uh, tell him about developments, uh, and try to continue his interest uh, in what we were doing. And he and I had a very good relationship. He was a crusty, uh, feisty individual, but had uh, a good heart, and he was a fine person and a great friend of SMU. In 1974 then, or perhaps it was the spring of 75, you became a dean of the School of Business. Uh, what, as you think back over those, was it seven or eight years then, you were in the deanship, Ellen, uh, what were the transformations that took place in, the, in that school? It was not the Cox School at that time. No, it was, it was not. It was entitled the SMU School of Business. That's right. And we were in the Fincher Building, which still exists at the core of the current expanded facility. I think the major changes that I was concerned with in those years as dean was first and foremost trying to strengthen the faculty by first recruiting aggressively in significantly stronger business schools for new faculty. And we brought in several faculty members from major schools, uh, one or two from Harvard, a couple from Stanford, some from other uh, major schools around the country. And at the same time, uh, we were able to uh, gradually reduce some of the old-time faculty members who were either approaching retirement or interested in leaving. And there was a great emphasis in those years in the mid-70s in strengthening the faculty. Then the second thing was fundraising. Uh, a number of new endowed chairs were created uh, during those years, and uh, that allowed us to do further aggressive recruiting. Um, let me go back one step. Mm. Can you remember the names of some of the faculty who came to SMU at that time? Well, um, Tom Hofstede came from Stanford. Uh, Neil mm. Churchill came from Harvard Business School. Um, there, were, there were a number who came, uh, each of whom represented a real uh, strengthening of the resources we had at the time, but those are a couple of names that come to mind. Um, at the same time, we um, created the Executive MBA program, which was launched about 1976, as I recall, and has now become one of the major flagship programs of the business school and uh, has a, really a genuinely a national recognition now. It's a very strong executive MBA program reflecting yes, this. Yes, only, only recently the school was ranked very high in a Wall Street Journal poll, as That's I recall. right, it was. And so that, the executive MBA program started, uh, so I would say strengthening the faculty, fundraising, new endowed chairs, the executive MBA program, and another program which I was very proud of was a joint degree program between the business school and the Meadows School of the Arts, a joint degree in arts administration, which was designed to give administrative training to young people who wanted to um, join administratively arts organizations, symphonies, uh, museums, uh, organizations dedicated to cultural activities who always have scarce resources and which need to be managed exceptionally skillfully. So we did start that program with the 
Meadows School of the Arts as a dual degree program. And then I think um, two other major events that occurred in this same time period was the first the strengthening of the accreditation and the renewal of our accreditation for the undergraduate program and then even more significantly the formal accreditation of the MBA program which uh, prior to this time, this was in about 1977 I guess, prior to this time the MBA program had not been accredited. So we got national accreditation for the MBA program during these years as well. And then probably the capstone um, during this time was the naming of the business school for Edwin Cox, whom I've alluded to earlier, but Ed Cox made significant gifts to the business school and the school <coughs> in 1978 was named for Ed Cox. Uh, so becoming, thus becoming the Edwin L. Cox School of Business. I should mention in that regard, since this is historical material, that in the SMU archives, uh, I caused a history book of the SMU Business School to be prepared and published in a fine press edition aided by our wonderful Bridwell librarian at the time, Deckard Turner. And uh, we prepared hastily but in a quality way a history of the business school, copies of which are in the SMU archives. Also, <coughs> were, were you the author of that text? Uh, I was the editor, but I engaged two people to do the legwork and to do the actual writing, and then I did the revisions of the draft, mm -hmm. but those are the authors. And um, uh, then at the same time, all through the period we're discussing, 1974 to 1988, I kept history archives and historical archival material uh, which, uh, just as a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I've sent over to the de Gaulle Library and in um, boxes that are about now about eight feet long, uh, eight major boxes, each about a foot wide, are historical materials covering the period of my deanship and the period we haven't talked about yet of the banking school leadership. And those archival materials, together with the historical book on the business school, which was published at the time of the naming ceremony in 1978, those are all in the SMU Historical Archives. And they cover all of the period in great detail that we're now reviewing. You mentioned, Alan, the, uh, uh, the uh, achievement of uh, several endowed chairs in the school during that period. Uh, what were those chairs? There were chairs in marketing, there were chairs in uh, quantitative methods, uh, there were chairs in um, industrial production, uh, there was an additional chair in finance, there were a couple of chairs in accounting, there were perhaps a half a dozen chairs that were created uh, during those years. So at the time that I started as dean, we had two endowed chairs, one in finance, the Carruth chair, and one in marketing. And I think at the time I left, we had about eight endowed chairs. And in those historical archives, there is a booklet that describes the endowed chairs of the business school in around that period, so a future researcher could get the details of each of the chairs and when they were established and so forth. Well, I think that's valuable archival material. You mentioned the development of a, a joint master's program with the Meadows School. Um, there were relationships with other schools, uh, however, that you helped to uh, help to tighten. Uh, was there not a joint degree program with the, with the School of Law, for example? Uh, there was a joint degree program with the School of Law, which was in uh, also initiated, and there was a uh, joint degree program with engineering as well. And so we had three of those joint degrees. And um, one of the things that suffered during the Grayson era was the uh, relationship on campus between the business school 
and the other component schools, the other four or five schools uh, on the campus. And one of the things I tried to do was to bring the business school into a more harmonious relationship with the other schools and to reach out to them and to show an interest on the part of the business school to the other intellectual and academic centers on the community. And I must say in that regard, one of my pleasures, although each one is a chore, is I was asked to do three, to chair three dean searches for SMU during the time I was dean. Uh, and two of the three are perhaps slightly remarkable in the sense that uh, I chaired the search committee for a new dean for the School of Engineering. And then soon after that, after two other search committees had not been productive, I was asked to chair the uh, search for the deanship of the Meadows School of the Arts, which I was pleased to do because of our keen interest in that school and my personal interest in that school. And that brought uh, Jean Bonelli back to the campus as dean. And uh, that was, uh, I think, an important accomplishment. But the third one <coughs> was... Bonelli was subsequently a president of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. That's right. He served as dean for several years, and then I left SMU and became the head of the uh, Dallas Symphony Organization. And I think has only recently announced his retirement from that. that I just task. learned that, as a matter of fact, today. That's right. Mm -hmm. But the third deanship I f search I found to be perhaps remarkable in many regards. And that was I was asked... Uh, to chair the dean, the search for the new dean for the Perkins School of Theology, which for a business school dean to be asked to undertake that assignment, I felt both honored and frankly flattered <laughs> because it was unusual. And in fact, uh, Joe uh, Quillian, who was the outgoing dean retiring, uh, said to me, Joe was fond of making man mandalas. Uh, he would sit in board meetings and freehand would draw these very magnificent mandalas, some of which, in fact, were later made into women's scarves at Neiman Marcus. They were works of art. And Joe approached me and said, would I be willing to serve as chair of the search committee for Perkins? And uh, after some thought, I said, well, Joe, if you'll give me, if I'm successful, one of your mandalas, uh, I will agree to undertake that assignment. And he willingly did that. Uh, that search led to Jim Kirby coming as dean of the School of Theology. And a good deal later, uh, at a, for a time, Jim Kirby became acting president of yes. SMU. And a few months after Kirby's arrival, um, Joe Quillian came to my office and presented me with the mandala, which I still have and which is uh, a pleasure to reflect on as an interesting assignment. But I thought those searches reflected well on the business school in the sense that we were becoming more of a campus good citizen, and that was an important objective. So, Ellen, since your departure, and even your departure from SMU, the facilities uh, of the School of Business, the physical facilities, have enormously expanded. Uh, could you anticipate any of that at the time you were in the deanship? No, we, um, as we talked about the priorities for the business school, it was clear there were two very major ones. The first was the strengthening of the faculty, without question. And I hearken back to my days uh, as a faculty member at the Stanford Business School, when a wonderful new dean and a great leader came in, Ernie Arbuckle. At that time, Stanford was in a very modest set of buildings and rooms, and Ernie set as his priorities, number one, greatly strengthen the faculty. And then, much later, when the faculty is demonstrably improved, go for the building that would appropriately reflect and house the stronger faculty. 
As I looked at the situation at SMU, it seemed to me that those priorities made sense here. So uh, in the time that I was dean over those six or seven years, uh, it took that amount of time to really begin to strengthen the faculty materially. And I made the conscious decision not to try for monies related to buildings, but rather to try to strengthen the faculty for two reasons. First, I thought the priorities first were people and then secondarily buildings, but also at all during those years there was great administrative turmoil at the center <coughs> of the university as I've discussed earlier. It was probably not practical and feasible to really contemplate an important building program during a time of so much turmoil because we had an average tenure of presidents and acting presidents that worked out to be about two years, seven and 14 years. As a result, it was a lot easier to contemplate uh, raising the quality of faculty, seeking endowed chairs and that sort of thing rather than all of the effort involved in buildings. And so I think appropriately, uh, faculty first, then when I stepped out, and we'll discuss a little later the next role, which was the Graduate School of Banking at SMU, uh, my successor, uh, Roy Herberger, uh, who I think inherited a significantly stronger faculty, and then with stability at the central part of the university with the uh, coming of Ken Pai and the restructuring of the governance system, the conditions were created where a major building program was feasible. And Roy appropriately moved ahead with that and the new buildings were created. And then I think you have what you have today, which is a significantly stronger faculty and an accredited program that's respected nationally and in a very handsome new set of buildings. So that's mm -hmm. been the progression and the logic. Well, that gets the priorities right, and I hope they're priorities this university can always keep in mind. It's what takes place in the classroom rather than the classroom itself that is important. You inherited one or two more questions, Alan, about the School of Business before we turn to the School of Banking. Uh, you inherited a curriculum uh, with which Jack Grayson and his colleagues had played rather fast and easy. That is to say, they had done some substantial restructuring in the curriculum in the School of Business, uh, even to the extent that uh, the undergraduate program came close to losing its accreditation. That's right. Uh, that, all, that all disappeared somewhere, and it must have been early in your deanship. It did disappear. We were under some threat of uh, a loss of accreditation or being put on probation with the undergraduate program, the bachelor's program, and um, uh, the master's program, as I indicated, was not accredited. So we um, uh, moved very quickly to try to find out the concerns of the American Assembly of Collegiate Schools of Business, the AACSB, as to their concerns about our curricular changes that had occurred in a few earlier years and what the uh, nature of those concerns were. And then I began to address them. Courses were changed, content was changed, and we moved rapidly into compliance for accreditation purposes, which is tremendously important and has uh, some validation across the country, certainly. Some of the courses that Jack Grayson had introduced uh, and others that were dropped uh, changed our curricular balance in an adverse way as viewed by the accrediting authorities and I think as viewed by many thoughtful faculty. So we changed that and then we also changed dramatically the content of the MBA program and brought that into line such that we could get that accredited as well. So those changes well, occurred uh, all during this period of time. Creativity, I think, in, uh, in uh, pedagogical processes is important, but a certain conformity uh, is important as well. Uh, time uh, constrains us, Alan, to turn to uh, 
your period as director of the Southwestern Graduate School of Banking. How did the transition come about when you left the School of Business? Well, the transition occurred, uh, again, for historical purposes, to be candid, um, in 1980-81. And at that time, the Central University was again in some turmoil. Uh, Jim Zumberg, uh, the then president, had resigned and left to take the presidency of the University of Southern California. Uh, we get, again went into a search uh, mode, uh, the university did, uh, and uh, were searching for a new president. Uh, at about that time, a very wonderful SMU faculty member, Richard Johnson, a professor of economics, and who indeed I think started the economics Dick program. Dick was the uh, creator of the PhD program. Of the PhD in program yes, in as economics. Well as the banking school and and uh, Dick was a wonderful faculty member uh, and an entrepreneur, Par excellence. Uh, uh, absolutely of the highest level. And Dick recognized Dick <coughs> Johnson. Uh, back in 1957 that there was a great need for banking and financial education that brought a combination of economics and banking education and finance together. And so Dick created the Southwestern Graduate School of Banking in 1957. And uh, while he was an SMU economics professor, uh, directed, created, and directed the program, which has the acronym SWIGSBY, Southwestern Graduate School of Banking. And Dick ran that program for many years and propelled it into a program of regional and even national recognition. Uh, Dick was a first-rate entrepreneur. He brought very high-quality people to the SMU campus in the field of banking and finance and governmental regulation of banking. And uh, he ran that program with great success. And then a few years later, he established a foundation which um, uh, gave him some fiscal independence. The foundation was able to raise some funds independently. And it was the Southwestern Graduate School of Banking Foundation, which Dick also headed, Dick Johnson. Um, during the and which you headed then, in and turn. And which subsequently I headed. Uh, during the Grayson years, Dick Johnson, who was a very sound academic, became increasingly skeptical of the business school. And he and Jack Grayson, to put it um, charitably, did not get along at all. And so Dick became, in effect, separated from the business school. The economics department did move out from its relationship with the business school earlier, as you had mentioned. And Dick Johnson um, uh, <coughs> continued his work with the banking school. When I took over as dean, I recognized that Dick was an important SMU faculty member and one who uh, deserved much greater recognition and praise for what he had done for the SMU uh, community in the recognition and the quality programs that he had developed. So I reached out and began to work with Dick Johnson and began to bring him more uh, into the family, so to speak, of the business school. And he and I developed quite a comfortable and friendly relationship. Sadly, in the summer of 1980, Dick succumbed to cancer and died. And um, right about that time, Jim Zumberg left and we were again, we the SMU community, were again in turmoil. Um, during that time of the search and some uncertainty as to our future direction, and Jim Brooks became acting president and did a very competent job during that period, um, I was approached by the foundation trustees of the banking school upon Dick's death, asking if I would have any interest in um, joining that organization. And um, I left it on hold for a time while the search was going on. And when the search concluded and Don Shields became the new president, um, 
I concluded reluctantly that this turmoil which we had experienced was probably going to continue, which indeed it did, and indeed became considerably worse uh, in the next uh, two or three or four years. And so I decided that perhaps it was appropriate to step out of the deanship, uh, retain the Carruth Chair of Financial Management, uh, and to accept the presidency of the Banking School Foundation and the directorship of the Banking School. So I did that, worked out those details with the then acting president, Jim Brooks, and uh, I made the transition in 1981 over to the banking school. Uh, subsequent to that, we had the major athletic scandals, the eventual resignation of Don Shields, and the genuine crisis in the governance structure of the university. But all during that time, I was over in the banking school and teaching two courses a year as Carruth Professor of Finance. Uh, and enjoying uh, return to the classroom as well as some academic administration. I came to the Department of Economics when Dick was still its young chairman. <clears throat> and I remember well the creation of the banking school and the banking school foundation. As I recall it, Dick wanted to gather senior bankers into annual conferences. Uh, and he talked of conferences in uh, Bangkok and in Cairo and other exotic places to the extent that made Willis Tate roll his eyes uh, from the president's <laughs> office. And at that <coughs> point, Dick uh, decided that he needed financial independence of some degree uh, in order to accomplish his, his ends. And the uh, Southwestern Graduate School of Banking Foundation uh, was the result of it. That's right. That's right, and Dick uh, did, he didn't go, he did a little bit of the overseas thing. He didn't quite get as exotic as perhaps his imagination would have liked to carry him, although he did some of it. And uh, he did have programs, and I continued uh, a limited number of programs overseas. But mostly, he created an environment in which we brought really nationally prominent financial people to SMU, bankers and financial mm -hmm. uh, regulators. We always had the director of the FDIC in our programs. We had the controller of the currency. We had members of the Federal Reserve Board. We occasionally had the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Dick laid, uh, Dick Johnson laid a track where it was expected that important figures in Washington from time to time would come to SMU for banking conferences, and I was fortunate to be able to go to the banking school with a really sound base and a reputation for quality that Dick had laid, and to that I, I, I really uh, tip my hat to him and owe him a great deal of credit, mm -hmm. and I carried those activities on then for the next uh, uh, about seven years during the time I was there. Succeeded by your colleague, uh, George Hempel, who has now passed away, I That's think. right. And Ellen, our time grows short, and I want to ask you to reflect then, in a general way, back on what's happened to SMU over this longish period. Well, I think as we sit today in the year 2001, at the, uh, in the late month of November, and as I look back, to 1974, so we're talking about a 26 or 27 year span. The university, as I have tried to follow it from a distance because my family and I now live in California, the university has passed through what surely must be its most tumultuous period in SMU history, the period 1974 to <coughs> uh, the um, uh, mid-1980s with leadership changes, uh, dramatic restructuring of the governance structure, major athletic scandals, the loss of significant financial support because of some of those scandals, the need to regroup, the need to restructure governance, and the need to get new, strong, and competent leadership at the center of the university. 
that's uh, as well as all of the athletic problems that wo were woven through that period, that's a tremendous strain on any academic institution. And it was a great strain on the uh, SMU organization. But now as those times have drifted to the past, and as we see the healing process which has begun and continues, and we see the important building programs and the strengthening of major programs within the university, I look at it as we sit here today and feel that out of that crucible of indeed fire, organizationally, structurally, financially, ethically, uh, SMU has emerged as a much stronger place to be, a much stronger academic institution of increasing strength regionally and beginning strength nationally, um, and with an opportunity to grow, which I view as absolutely tremendous. The Southwest generally, Dallas and Texas in particular, uh, represent a powerful launching pad for a private academic institution. And in this part of the broad United States, there are very few academic private institutions so that we have a sheltered geographic market environment. And I think really that coming out of all of these difficulties, SMU has emerged as a quality institution, strengthened by its turmoil, and really now beginning perhaps at the start of the 21st century to achieve what um, was delayed because of these problems. But now I think it has a chance to reach for genuine national academic significance uh, and over this next say quarter century I would hope this institution would emerge in its rightful place as a very major quality private institution upholding uh, the best traditions in America of leadership which has always come from the private sector to lend quality to academic institutions nationally. We've been talking with Dr. Ellen Kuhlman who has uh, come uh, from California to uh, help us make this recording of some SMU history. Ellen, uh, it's nice to have you here. Thank you, Thanks Carter. For coming. It's a pleasure to talk to a good old friend. Thank you very much. <laughs>